Hey, podcast listeners. Thanks for tuning into Brainwaves this week. Before we get into today's program, just a simple request. Please rate our show on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play, wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps us out. Thanks. Jim Siegler here for Brainwaves. This week on the show, we'll be quickly summarizing the clinical importance of the ulnar nerve. And I'm no neuromuscular specialist these days, so I've asked my friend, Dr. Noah Levinson, to help me out. Uh, hi, my name's uh, Noah Levinson. I'm a fourth-year neurology resident at Penn, and I'll be a neuromuscular fellow next year. And I'm really interested in neuromuscular disease, in particular, uh, myasthenia gravis and Guillain-Barre syndrome. To get us started, I'd like to say that compared to the other peripheral nerves we've discussed on the podcast, like the perineal nerve, the facial nerve, the radial nerve, the ulnar nerve is so much simpler. But that doesn't mean that it can't be confusing or interesting. From an epidemiologic perspective, ulnar neuropathy at the elbow is the second most commonly diagnosed focal neuropathy, surpassed only by median neuropathy at the wrist. The ulnar nerve is probably the one you've noticed before in yourself, likely from hitting your elbow against something. It's the nerve that signals information that you interpret as your funny bone. But there's so much more to it than that. And to get us started, I'll go ahead and turn the mic over to Noah. Welcome back to the show. Thanks, Jim. It's always great to be here. Let's start by describing the anatomy of the ulnar nerve, just so we can get an idea of what we're dealing with. Sure. So, yeah, the ulnar nerve is derived from the anterior rami of the nerve roots of C8 and T1. And these fibers are initially carried in the lower trunk and then the medial cord of the brachial plexus, and then eventually come out as the ulnar nerve arising in the proximal axilla. And importantly, clinically, it has no motor or sensory branches above the elbow, Um, And so what that means is that a lesion in the axilla is going to be clinically indistinguishable from one around the elbow. At the midpoint of the upper arm, the ulnar nerve dives down through the medial intermuscular septum and then travels down the arm alongside the humerus. Then at the elbow, the ulnar nerve travels within the retrocondylar or ulnar groove just posteriorly to the medial epicondyle. As the nerve exits the groove, it passes under the aponeurotic arch of the flexor carpi ulnaris muscle which is also called the humero-ulnar arcade, which is formed by the attachments of that muscle to the medial epicondyle and the electronon. This is an important area for the ulnar nerve because it's the most common site of ulnar entrapment, and it's occurring there at that medial epicondyle of the elbow. And the ulnar nerve has only two motor branches that originate just in the forearm. It's the branch that goes to the flexor carpi ulnaris and the branch that goes to the flexor digitorum profundus, which is the one that's supplying digits four and five. Uh, there's also a single sensory branch to the ulnar nerve, and it too is given off at the level of the forearm. This pulmonar cutaneous branch ends up innervating the skin to the hypothenar region of the hand, uh, that fourth and fifth digit area. Um, Then after this branch point, the remainder of the ulnar nerve is going to continue down through the forearm and then dive through Guillain's canal to enter the hand. And that's also very clinically relevant because this is the second most common site of ulnar entrapment after compression of the medial epicondyle. So compression at Guillain's canal should not cause a superficial sensory disturbance, but we'll get into the weakness due to the compression here later on in the show. Um, And then once the ulnar nerve gets into the hand, it supplies a variety of the intrinsic hand muscles, you know, most notably the first dorsal interosseous muscle, and then also the lumbricals. All right, so that was some pretty good background. And now when you want to localize a lesion at the ulnar nerve to any level between the elbow and the forearm and down to the hand, what kind of processes are going through your mind? Well, you know, first, I think it's important to just uh, mention that, you know, ulnar neuropathy at the elbow is not just one thing. There can be compression or damage at different places in that area. There can be several sites of injury which include compression at that retrocondylar groove at the elbow. But most commonly, the injury does happen due to entrapment under that humeral ulnar arcade, which is kind of the classic cubital tunnel syndrome. So when you're thinking about the etiology of ulnar nerve lesions at the elbow, I always look for a history or any any signs of acute trauma um, that could be causing damage to the nerve. And things to think about would be a distal humeral fracture, Um, which can cause nerve injury. You can get a a focal nerve laceration as well. And then um, if there's surgery in the area, you can also get a perioperative injury. And then the other type of nerve compression that can happen there is either internal or external. 
And when you're thinking about external sources of nerve compression, that can be from traction injury during a surgery, or oftentimes that can just be external compression from leaning on your elbow and pressing that ulnar nerve. And most of you are probably familiar with this because uh, if you accidentally bump your elbow or push your elbow in the wrong spot, you get that funny sensation that travels down your arm into your fingers. And that's what most people know as hitting your funny bone. And then likewise, there can also be intrinsic causes of nerve compression in the elbow. And that's usually due to elbow joint pathology, which can be due to osteophytes, arthritis, inflammation of the synovial space, like a synovitis, or abnormal muscles or fibrous bands in that area. And then importantly, if ulnar neuropathy is happening in the setting of other compressive neuropathies, like a perineal neuropathy or a median neuropathy, start thinking about other systemic illnesses like diabetes that can predispose to nerve injury, or also sometimes genetic disorders, the most common one being this hereditary neuropathy with liability to pressure palsies, or HNPP, which is caused by a deletion in the PMP22 gene, the same gene that's duplicated in CMT1A. And my understanding about uh, management of peripheral neuropathies is not that advanced. With the exception of these genetic causes, when you see somebody who has a peripheral compressive neuropathy uh, of the ulnar nerve, what can you do when you suspect that there is ulnar compression at the level of the cubital tunnel? Well, I would say it depends a lot on what is actually going on and what's causing the damage, but usually it's just conservative measures. So that's keeping the elbow in a proper position. Um, That's also um, avoiding compression or external damage to the nerve. If you're concerned that there's an intrinsic elbow pathology going on, then you can get x-rays, which can show the arthritis or the osteophytes that have formed. If there is severe clinical injury and um, the patient can't tolerate the symptoms, then you can go for surgery. And that would be an ulnar transposition, which would be moving the ulnar nerve out of that groove. So kind of moving down the arm from the elbow to the wrist, the next location of pretty common injury is the injury due to compression at Guillain's Canal. And I know that you and I both have a mutual friend who ended up developing a mild acute ulnar neuropathy at the wrist just from riding his bike for a single long ride. And that actually is so commonly documented that people call it the handlebar palsy. Mm -hmm. And there are other extrinsic causes of uh, compression at that area due to things like bone fractures, such as uh, injury at the hook of hamate and sometimes focal lacerations, and even repetitive trauma, such as repetitive flexion injury at that level of the wrist. But now that we've gone through most of the anatomy of the ulnar nerve, let's move on to some of the more tricky concepts, like how you distinguish an ulnar neuropathy from like a C8 radiculopathy. Sure. So first, you can do certain provocative maneuvers to see if there's any injury or irritation to the ulnar nerve. Some of those people might be familiar with already, something like the Tennell's test, which is tapping on a nerve and seeing if it elicits symptoms. You can also put the arm in certain positions that causes stretch to the ulnar nerve, like elbow flexion. Um, And then you can actually just push on the nerve too and see if it elicits symptoms as well. You know, the problem is because all of us just, if we bump our elbow on a table, that causes symptoms of ulnar neuropathy. You know, that's not a very sensitive or specific test for uh, kind of underlying irritation or inflammation in that area. But they're definitely still worth doing. And You know, if you mentioned that you did a Tennell's test and it was positive, that might impress someone. And what about distinguishing an ulnar neuropathy from a C8 radiculopathy? Now, weakness in a C8 distribution is pretty easy to identify because nearly all of the intrinsic hand muscles receive input from C8, regardless of which nerve the information is being carried down. So the ulnar nerve, the median nerve, and the radial nerve are all innervating intrinsic hand muscles, which you can test. So if you wanted to check the median nerve, you could check the APB muscle, which does thumb abduction. That's innervated by the C8 nerve root. And then if you wanted to check C8 innervation through the radial nerve, you could check the extensor indices proprius, which is supplied by the radial nerve, but also is supplied by the C8 nerve root. So importantly, if the APB and the extensor indices proprius are intact as well, but the finger flexors are still weak, then you know it's not a C8 process. And what about distinguishing like an ulnar neuropathy from a lower trunk or a medial cord lesion? Now, so that definitely gets a little more complicated because we're starting to deal with the brachial plexus. Uh, But a lower trunk lesion would involve some median nerve muscle weakness. And so the patients would have weakness of the APB. And there would also be forearm sensory involvement and weakness of the extensor indices proprius. Now that is practically indistinguishable from a C8 radiculopathy. So that's pretty difficult to, to distinguish clinically. 
Now, to distinguish an ulnar neuropathy from a medial cord process, you have to think about what the posterior cord supplies, which is radial nerve innervated muscles. In a medial cord lesion, you would not expect any weakness of radial nerve muscles like the extensor indices proprius, but you should still get weakness of all the ulnar nerve muscles in addition to some median nerve muscles like the APB. Sometimes I think it's important to step back too and think more broadly about what could be going on. So in a situation where someone is having sensory symptoms in their arm, you should also think about what other pathology could cause problems in the cervical spinal cord. And so when I think about someone who's having arm numbness, and particularly if it's bilateral arm numbness, then I would start thinking about a spinal cord process like syringomyelia, which can be associated with painful sensory changes or loss of sensation to pain and temperature, which usually happens in a dermatomal or a few dermatomal distributions from C5 to T1. And we've been talking about all of this clinically and exam-based, but nerve conduction studies can be really helpful in this situation in showing intact sensory responses in a C8 radiculopathy because that would be preganglionic, but not in a peripheral ulnar neuropathy, which would be postganglionic. So I think everything you just covered has been probably the most high yield that we're going to discuss in this episode. And you make it seem like identifying an isolated ulnar neuropathy is actually not that tricky. But sometimes when you get to these nerve conduction studies, the results may not always be so straightforward. So how are people sometimes tricked by what the EMG nerve conduction study show? Jim, I think what you might be getting at here is something called the Martin Gruber anastomosis. So the Martin Gruber anastomosis, it's a normal anatomic variant that is actually seen pretty commonly in 15 to 30% of people who have nerve conduction studies done. And it can be kind of confusing to understand, so it's definitely worth talking about here. So there are a lot of variations of the normal arrangements of the peripheral nerves as they travel down the arm. And Jim, I know you're going to put up a graphic on the Brainwaves blog to make this a little simpler. But in the classic Martin Gruber anastomosis, a branch of the median motor nerve is going to cross over in the forearm to join the distal ulnar nerve. And only motor fibers should be crossing in that anastomosis. Electrophysiologically, what that means is that median nerve stimulation at the elbow should produce a normal response in median nerve innervated muscles like the APB. However, median nerve stimulation at the wrist is going to result in a lower CMAP for the APB because some of those motor fibers have crossed over and they're traveling in the ulnar nerve through the Guyon's canal. That same reduction in CMAP can also be seen in a carpal tunnel syndrome, but in the Martin Gruber anastomosis, you're not going to see other features like conduction slowing or conduction block. Next, if you stimulate the ulnar nerve at the wrist, uh, the CMAP of the ulnar innervated muscles would actually be larger than you would expect if you'd stimulated the ulnar nerve at the elbow because now you're recruiting additional median nerve branches that are traveling in the ulnar nerve. And that can sound complicated, but I think if you understand the anatomy, and especially if you look at the picture, um, it starts to make more sense. Now, what can make matters even more difficult is, you know, patients don't follow the textbook, and oftentimes a Martin Gruber anastomosis and a carpal tunnel syndrome will co-occur. They can happen at the same time in the same patient. And that sounds like it's going to get kind of complicated, but briefly, can you summarize for us what that might look like on EMG when you have a patient who has both a Martin Gruber anastomosis and carpal tunnel syndrome? Yeah, when you see the two of those together, median nerve stimulation at the elbow and recording at the APB is going to show slowed conduction velocities across the wrist which are due to focal demyelination. However, median nerve stimulation at the elbow and recording of the flexor digitorum profundus, which is an ulnar nerve innervated muscle, should show normal conduction velocities. That's because those ulnar nerves, which were hitching a ride with the median nerve, break off before the median nerve courses through that collapsing carpal tunnel. Well, I think we've said all we can about the ulnar nerve. Noah, thanks for walking us through the anatomy of the ulnar nerve and the various complications we see as clinicians in a patient who presents with hand weakness. There are a lot of mimics of ulnar neuropathy, from C8 root lesions to distal peripheral branch pathologies, and then the Martin Gruber anastomosis always confuses me. Thanks for clarifying all this for us. Thanks, Jim. It's always fun to come on the show. And with that, I think we'll wrap up the show this week. If you like what you heard, you can find more information and some images on the blog at brainwaves.me. And if you're a neurology resident or you're a physician who's planning to recertify your neurology boards this year, I really recommend that you check out the Penn Neurology Board Review course. Just go to pennneuroboard2018.com. You can get $150 off your registration fees by using the promo code 
WAVES2018. That's W-A-V-E-S in all caps, 2018. The Brainwaves podcast is based out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Jim Siegler, senior producer. This week's episode was prepared by Noah Levinson. Music courtesy of Josh Woodward, Milton Arias, Ian Sutherland, Lee Rosevere, and Unheard Music Concepts. I'm Jim Siegler, and we'll talk to you next week.